Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to our uh, mayor debate, 2017 mayor debate tonight. We are so excited. There is a lot of excitement in, uh, in the room. So we're going to get started, but before everything, I, would, um, I wanted to thank everybody for being here and joining us for this event. This debate is organized by the Highland Coalition, our 2017 mayoral debate. And um, we have two candidates here that are competing for this. So my name is Chish Mukala, and I'm the co-chair of the Highland Coalition. We have, a, we have a lot of things to discuss today that is really uh, concerning our city and our community. So we, I wanted to let you know that we have a table at the entrance. If you haven't signed up, please go ahead and sign up for us so we can appreciate you. And um, let me just get my glasses. <laughs> Thank you. Like I said, my name is Chish, and uh, there is a whole lot of things to, uh, to, to discuss today. But I want to quickly go over some uh, background, background rule that I have for tonight. So I, be, I will be the moderator, and I will guide the discussion. We'll, he, we'll give uh, the candidates two minutes to introduce themselves. And uh, we will have also a panel of people that will ask each candidate questions. When the panels come up, they will say the name and they will ask the question. So the candidate will have two minutes to answer the question and uh, 30 seconds to respond. If the candidate is called out for criticism, we will give them one minute to respond to that as well. I'll ask the audience if you have extra questions, since we only have one hour to write them down, there will be somebody passing around with the, uh, in the, the something to write, index card, write your question, put it in the box at the desk, and then uh, we will make sure the candidate will receive those questions and get back to you. If we have time left, we can read some of these questions right here, right now. We also have a red box at the desk. If you can put in your preference, your candidate of preference, that's for the Highland Coalition discre discretion. So you feel free to do that as well. Um, we will have a keeper of time who will notify the candidates and warn them if they have 30 seconds left in their response so they can wrap up. But before we get started, I wanted to call David Gass, the director of Highland Coalition, to come up and tell us a little bit of what is Highland Coalition and what they do. David. Thank you all for coming about 10 years ago we started, but I've got to go back a little bit. Everything is a history. And the history of the Highlands is placed in the hands of one man who was the mayor of Lynn. His name was James Buffum. And James Buffum was the mayor of Lynn after the Civil War. The reason the Highlands was not developed is because it didn't have water, but he brought water down from, from the what's now Lynn Woods and pipes and develop downtown. That's the, what's the, that's the role a mayor can play in changing the city. He changed the city and then he developed the streets in the Highlands and Ocean Street. So we have a lot to thank for James Upham, but before he did that, he was also a friend of one of Lynn's greatest people, which is Frederick Douglass. And he helped Douglass, you read his history, read his history. I, I learned nothing about this history when I went to school here. But it's very important to know how something comes about and how things can change. So when we, about 10 years ago, we planted trees going up to Rockway Street. And we met Dr. Crane, who said, come on in and form a neighborhood group. Because the Ford School at that time 
was a community school, and it was the only one in Lynn. And it had night school, it had, it had after school programs, it was a NASA school, it was very, I was very impressed with it. And she invited us in, about 30 of us met, to decide how we're going to help the Highlands and work in the Highlands to organize people. And so we started with the idea of what the problems are. And it went from rats, which is now, thanks to the, uh, the cart system, is, 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 is diminished, to the issue of housing, because right after that, Highlands became a center of foreclosures in Lynn and the North Shore. Hundreds of units were foreclosed. What do we do about that? Well, we organized several protests. We saved two families' homes from, uh, from eviction, two families. There was a Cambodian family on Rockaway Street and an African-American family on Rockaway Street. And because we had a picket line and we worked with Lindy Niner for change, we got the homes back in their hands for half the mortgage. That was a tremendous victory. So we decided to do something on housing. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. And uh, again, if you haven't signed up yet, please sign at the, at the table at the entrance. Thank you. And uh, we have a lot to discuss, so we're going to go, go quickly go um, give the candidate two minutes to introduce themselves. But before that, David will toss up the coin and the candidate can start. So, David. Thank you, and uh, thank you for having this tonight. I want to thank everyone be for being here. Uh, welcome to the, uh, the debate here at uh, KIPP Academy. Uh, and I think, uh, David, you laid out, I think, some of the important things that we're talking about in this election. This is a, this is a rich city with rich history, uh, a place where people could come, find a job, raise their family, and, and build a good life here in the community. And I think the Highlands particularly reflects that. Uh, the Highlands Coalition has really, uh, I think, uh, embodied what the community is all about strength in neighborhoods, working with your neighbors and your friends to try and develop uh, a sense of community, working on the issues that impact the community, and as David laid out, I think uh, thoroughly earlier, uh, addressing the issues that in a negative way have impacted this community and trying to make it better, and just as importantly, having a larger vision about what can be uh, a better community and a better neighborhood, and uh, whether it be making sure that the voting, again, came back to this neighborhood, which I think is great. Um, establishing uh, uh, a, a vibrancy and, and an opportunity for the schools in this neighborhood. Uh, and, and again, I think that the Highlands reflects that rich strength of what the community is all about. We have great resources, whether it be the Lynn Waterfront, uh, downtown, uh, a really uh, amazing Lynn Woods, 2,200 acres of uh, parkland, the second largest in the country. But really, the strength of this community is the people that live in this city. And uh, again, the Highlands uh, and the Highlands Coalition re really embody what that's all about. So I'm excited to be here tonight. I look forward to answering questions and uh, look forward to uh, the next couple of weeks as we move towards an important election. Uh, thank you again for uh, having us here tonight. Good evening, everybody. First of all, let me apologize for my voice. It's, it's getting better. You should have heard it in debate one. And I want to thank Tisha and David and uh, Highlands Coalition and KIPP Academy for having us here. I've been the mayor for eight years, that's a long time. So I wanted to um, begin my opening statement with a list of the things that I've been able to accomplish over those eight years. First and foremost, we've been able to build a new Thurgood Marshall Middle School uh, where many of the children who live in the Highlands attend when they are 12 to 14 years old. Um, I uh, was able to build a new market basket on the former GE site which brings 381 jobs to the city. 86% of those are filled by winners. And uh, it also ser serves to uh, take to care of the food desert that's located in that portion of Lynn down by Federal Street. I brought Kettle Cuisine to Lynn. It's a soup company. Uh, that brought over 250 jobs to the Linway. Revitalized and air-conditioned the Lynn Auditorium, allowing for the expansion of yearly events from two to three that were held in 2009 to an, an anticipated 60 in 2017. I created a tax work-off program for homeowners over age 60, modernized Wyoming Square streets, 
and parking lot, doubling the number of spaces and increasing re revenue substantially. I instituted a reverse 911 emergency notification system. If you recall, we didn't have that in 2010. I provided free <clears throat> large trash and single stream recycling toters to every resident, resulting in a tripling of our recycling rate since 2010 and significantly diminishing the rodent and rat complaints that, complaints that we have gotten. I'm running out of time. I will complete my list as part of my closing statement. But thank you again for having us here. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay. Right, so are you ready? Yeah. Let's begin with the question. Um, First question would be asked by Ellen. Okay. Ellen, come up. And also you can read on the screen, the question will be showing up. Hello, my name is Ellen Morgan, and I live in the Highlands. Highland has paid millions of dollars in property taxes Yet, only one street has been paved in the Highlands in the past four years. This year, 34 Lynn streets were paved. Most were in areas where voting was much higher, such as Ward 1. The streets around the Ford School are in far worse condition and are a danger to drivers and children at the school. The question is, will you prioritize paving streets around the Ford School? Rock Ave, Hamilton Ave, and Beacon Hill Ave. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. When I received these questions from David, I went and looked at the streets that have been paved over the last several years. And while um, Beacon Hill is certainly one of the big premier streets that was paved, we also have paved Acorn Street from Hollingsworth to High Rock in 2016, Allen Avenue from Rock to Chestnut, uh, in 2012, Allen Avenue from Chestnut to Bede in 2014, uh, I mentioned Beacon Hill Ave, Bede Avenue in 2011, Grant Street 2009 to 2012, Halford Place in 2014, Hamilton Ave from Lawton to Rock 2014, and Hollingsworth in 2014. Um, so there have been a couple more than what was stated. Nonetheless, oh, and I didn't even realize these were two-sided. So there may even be a couple of more. Nonetheless, I drive these streets every workday. This is how I take my route home. And I agree with you, the streets are not in great shape. The way that the um, DPW does things is they rank the state of a street from one to 100 and they go based on that ranking of those most in need get paid first. However, um, we also spent a lot of our uh, Chapter 90 money this year refurbishing around the Market Basket, Spencer Street, etc. but I will prioritize the Rock, Hamilton, and Beacon Hill Avenue. I will speak with the DPO, DPW about it in the morning. Okay. So just to be clear, we're answer each answering the same questions? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you for the question. Uh, I think as, as I go around the community, uh, as, as you highlight the Highlands, I think the reality is that throughout the city, we have a real challenge that related to both our, our crumbling infrastructure, particularly the streets, and just as importantly, the sidewalks, where, whether it be sidewalks on the whole or uh, areas where the, uh, the uh, disability uh, issues are, where, where the uh, curbs are, the disability uh, access points are, are really in tough shape. Uh, the reality is the city is really facing a challenge in infrastructure. We need to take a look at creating a long-term plan, a five-year plan, and a longer plan, and, and how we address uh, the city streets throughout the community. And it can't be let's do it in one area uh, uh, this year, another area next year. We have to really create a plan that looks at the uh, state of the infrastructure throughout the city. I think another thing we can do to supplement what's going on with Chapter $90 is to start to access money through the uh, MPO, the Metropolitan 
pl uh, planning organization. There's state and federal dollars that are available to address uh, intersections that are uh, dangerous intersections that are uh, um, in places throughout this community. I think it's important that we put proposals to, in place. We check all of the check boxes that would really allow us to take advantage of those dollars, whether it be a gateway city, social justice community, as we have here in the, the Highlands Coalition, and uh, uh, the high uh, uh, dangerous intersections throughout the city. So I think we need to look at state and federal dollars, which are available, we need to pursue to supplement the chapter 90 dollars and put a plan in place that allows us to address the infrastructure throughout the community. You have 20 seconds to rebuttal. Yeah. Yeah, I just thought one sentence, actually. I just wanted to let people know that I do have a printout of all of the streets that have been paved since I took, mayor, took the office of mayor. There are over 50 miles of roads that have been paved in the city. They were neglected for a while, and we're doing it bit at a time as we can. Um, but it will take a while, but I gave you my word. I will check in with DPW tomorrow morning, and let's start to address the, the condition of the roads in the Highlands. Yeah. I guess that, yeah. Thank you. Question number two goes to David Gass. The federal government says that we should pay no more than 30% of our income on housing. However, most lenders pay more than 50% of their income on housing. The mayor has stated that the lender had enough affordable housing. Developers of apartments in Central Square will receive a tax break possibly of $1 million over a period of time, but none of the units will be affordable. Waterfront developers were offered a tax break. The question I have is, will you support a tax break to developers who create no affordable units? Thank you for the question, David. Uh, and I, uh, I understand the numbers that uh, the question reflects. I just want to be clear on a, at least a report that was filed earlier this year by IKG through the Housing Authority that reflected that 50% of the community uh, of the city of citizens of the city of Lynn pay over 30 percent of their income, whether they're owners or or are or, or in rental units. So I know those numbers reflected a little differently, but it does reflect a substantial issue in the community. I think what we need to do is uh, we we absolutely need to look at market rate and workforce housing, but we also have to make sure that the uh, affordable housing is a piece of our larger plan. And and it gets back, I think, in in many ways to uh, the. Um, uh, the lack of a planning department in the community. That RKG report also reflected that we need to put in place number the one, pri one number one priorities for us to affect those changes is to have a planning department so that we can make the proper decisions and move the kind of uh, housing op options, of affordable housing and other options available in the city, move it forward with the, with the right plan. The Washington Street project, I think, reflects what is a really good pr proposal. Uh, it's market rate, workforce housing, and affordable housing. That project is close to completion, and there was a lot of people at work to make that, put that project in place. There are other projects in the community that are looking towards market rate, but we really do need to have an affordable and a workforce housing piece as we move forward, and that needs to be a plan that we develop. And Lynn is not the only place where we're challenged in terms of what's going on with housing. It really is a regional uh, issue that we're facing, and so I think we need to look at it in a way that impacts both Lynn, what's the right plan for Lynn, what's to ensure that people aren't moved out of their homes while we create the uh, uh, the market rate housing that I think this community needs. And the mayors of Beverly, Salem, and Peabody have come together to start to talk about how the, re how the changes in housing are affecting us as a region. So again, it's putting a plan in place, trying to create a planning department that allows us to do that, and recognizing that as we develop market rate housing, we need to make sure that uh, a mix of uh, income housing is part of our future priorities in the city. I'm, I'm not sure I understand the answer to the question. The question was, will you support a tax break to developers who create no affordable units? 
That is the question. Uh, yes, I will. Because Lynn needs more market rate housing. Uh, we simply need to expand our tax base. We need the money. That's not to say I'm against affordable housing. The Gateway residents, of which the senator spoke, um, was having trouble getting financing. And in order for them to get the financing, I had to sign off under a mass law that would allow us to give them what amounts to a TIF, a break on taxes, and a reduction in the assessed value of the building so that they are able to get the affordable units and the workforce units. I am supporting the move by the Archdiocese to change the uh, former St. Michael's, uh, I mean, St. Patrick's uh, place, uh, the, their area into affordable housing, senior housing. Uh, the RKG uh, section that uh, the Senator refers to puts the city's actual supply of affordable housing at 22.9%. Now, compare that in the same uh, RKG study. Nahant, 3%. Peabody, 9.2%. Saugus, 7.0%. Swampscott, 3.7%. Every other community should be doing their fair share to put up some affordable housing as well. It should not simply fall on land. We should be looking at those communities and saying, what are you doing? And as far as the other component, the better way to go about this is to raise income. That's why I've always been a supporter of the E-Team, of the WIB, of any of the employment training programs that we have. So we don't have people who are not making a living wage and able to afford housing, whether it be workforce rate, market rate, or affordable. Let's get the income levels raised by getting the education and skills raised. <laughs> So, again, again, I think the numbers reflected in that report uh, indicate that 50% of the people in this community are struggling to make ends meet when you're talking about 30% of your income is going towards housing. So we need to understand that regardless of where the 22% uh, number that the mayor talked about is in place. The reality is that many people in this community are still struggling to make ends meet on housing. So we need to put a plan in place that makes sense to create the market rate housing that this community needs, but also recognize that we can't be forcing people out of the community when we're creating that market rate housing. But, and I really do think that the Washington Street Project is a great model. It's a union, uh, complete union project with union uh, dollars, pension dollars, and the tax breaks that came in were to create workforce housing that came from the state and affordable housing. And there is market right there. And I think that if you look to King's Lynn and the real success that had, that has had with a third a low income, a third a middle income, and a third high income, those are the kind of projects that we need to take a look at to ensure that we bring the value into the community, create market rate housing, but also ensure that people who live in this community aren't being forced out because of the, uh, the, property, the property values going up and the rents going up because of uh, uh, the challenges we face as a community. Uh, could I ask, uh, I, I have a question here that relates to this. Uh, working, in, working in Boston uh, that had $50 million from a, a program called Linkage for affordable housing, where housing is, the question is, do you support linkage? In other words, a, a, a developer comes in and puts $5 million into a building or $10 million, and you ask for a percentage of that uh, per square foot to build affordable housing somewhere else. And uh, uh, recently, Boston, I believe, has 70, 80, 90 million dollars to build stuff somewhere else. And I've worked on this in South Boston, and, and, and so the question is, um, do you support linkage? Because although uh, the Washington Street project you referred to, uh, we got $100,000 from the developers to open a night nice school at Lynn Tech. $100,000 donation instead of linkage, but my question is, would you support linkage for projects that may probably won't have any affordable housing? So that's an additional question. Is it directed to both of us, and how do you, uh, are we good? Is this an additional I question? I think the what, mayor is next. Or, aren't you, aren't you, do you want me to answer first? Oh, yeah, I think it's kind of loud. Can you turn me down a little? I scared myself. Really good now. Okay. We can hear each other. Okay, that's good. Um, the Washington Street money, that was the choice of the developer to give that to the city, and I thank them uh, profusely for it. I, I told you how much I support that, that training program. But as far as do I, I want to uh, 
have the concept of linkage here in Lynn? No, I do not. I do not believe it's right for me to tell a private developer how to spend his money or use his land to be developed. Um, if they would like to do that voluntarily, that's great. We can establish a fund for it. When Washington Street's developers did that for the city, I was very grateful for it. But I don't believe I should be telling, as a government official, a private developer how to develop private property. I saw Dr. Gren in the audience. Dr. Gren, Sorry. if you are in the audience, come up here. The question number two is yours. And to ask to the candidate. Dr. Gren. You are, uh, um, I think in fairness, the, the question was asked of both of us, and I'm. Yes. Um, yes. I think it's in fairness we we should both be able to answer that question. Yes. Um, so I, again, on the linkage, uh, I think I think at this point, when you're looking at Boston and the huge amount of investment going on and the the you know billions of dollars in development, uh, uh, they've created a, an, an appropriate plan because of the, uh, the, the uh, amount of development that's going on, they had to create a fund, the $50 million fund to create affordable housing in the city. I think Lynn is uh, in a different, definitely in a different place. What I think we should look to as we move forward is what are the right kind of plans as we work with developers. I think particularly whether it be in, in creating affordable housing or as developers or in developments happen in other communities, not in Boston, uh, there is, uh, you know, is the where you work with the developers to talk about mitigation, whether it be traffic mitigation or other uh, mitigation related to the project as it's going in. How is it impacting that neighborhood? How is it impacting that intersection, uh, the community? Uh, and I think the, the recent um, impact that's going on in, at, at the new Popeyes location reflects, uh, I think, on that. So I think it's premature to say we're going to, you know, we're going to do linkage and we create affordable housing off of that linkage. We're in a different place than Boston, but we, I think we clearly need to work with people that are making investments in the community that are impacting the community that we work as other communities do to find a way to. Uh, ensure that they make those investments to create uh, the value around that investment that they're making, particularly on the impact it has on the community. Now your turn, Dr. Crane. Um, thank you. I want to thank the Highland Coalition for inviting me to speak. Um, I would like to, um, as many of you know, um, Ford School was a community school. It was a community school. I was there 25 years. And each year, it was like building bricks, and we just kept building the bricks. And the community school became a national model for Harvard Graduate School of Education. Now that I'm retired, I got recruited by Salem State University, because I was on their adjunct faculty. And I have um, just opened up the community school center, which will be training teachers, um, they'll be training administrators, principals, and superintendents on what a real community school is like. Um, just for some of you who don't know what a community school is, a community school is a set of partnerships between the school and other community resources. It integrates academics, health, and social services, youth and community engagement, leading to improved student learning, stronger families, and healthier communities. It also educates the adults. So it takes the whole family in consideration. What I've been doing for the last two years since I've been um, over at Salem State University, there are many, many cities. In New York City, Mayor de Blasio just gave $26 million to make the New York City schools, community schools. We're working in partnership with Boston. Boston is called Hub Communities. They are in the process of setting up community schools. It's a national model. Um, we had a group of people come from Bridgeport, Connecticut, with Yale University. So it's all over the United States. And it, it really improves um, the family, the neighborhood, and there are many assets to it. So I would like to ask our candidates, do you support the community school model? <coughs> If so, would you, as chair of the school committee, work to create community schools in Lynn? Okay. 
I'll answer that first, Dr. Crane. It's good to see you. Um, I have been a strong supporter of the community school. I have been, in general, a supporter of the public schools. I sent my children from kindergarten to 12th grade to the public schools. Uh, and I also believe strongly in the autonomy of the principal of a school. Uh, in fact, I had a situation with uh, Dr. Crane and the Ford School several years ago where the administration decided they wanted to take away Dr. Crane's NASA classroom. And on a Friday afternoon, they were starting to bring the moving trucks up to the Ford School. And I stood in the doorway with Dr. Crane and some of the administration and staff of the Ford School to stop that from happening. Principals know their neighborhoods. We cannot have one size fits all schools. Something that works in Ward 1 is not necessarily going to work in the Highlands. Dr. Crane is a shining example of a principal who knew her neighborhood, knew what the people, not just the students, but the families around the school needed, and worked hard to create that environment for her neighborhood. And I applaud her for that and I literally fought them at the door to stop them from taking that away. I've also supported the, um, the wraparound zones in the schools, in the public schools, the health centers. We had one at the Thurgood Marshall Middle School. I insisted that we have that in there so it became more of a community place. I'm also a big charter school proponent. I don't like the funding formula, but I do like we need look no further than this cafeteria to see how a school can bring a community together for the good of all. So, um, yes, I, I absolutely love the concept of community schools. Thank you. Thank you for the question, um, Claire. And um, I've had a chance to work over the years with the, and see the great work that was going on uh, up here in the Highlands and the, the community school that was created, the NASA program, which was a great program, and all of the other things. And I think uh, uh, it is a great way to bring a community together. And it's not just using the school from 8 in the morning to 2 in the afternoon. It really reflects that the, the school becomes a place that the neighborhood understands and believes in, that parents can come there. And I know creating the opportunities for parents to get uh, uh, English as a second language classes, if that uh, is part of what can be created. But really, I think making the community feel that the school is not just uh, where their kids go and learn, but it's a, a vibrant part of the community. And I think part of that is also after school programming, which I'm a real strong advocate for, after school and out of school time, which is the summer. Uh, and again, being able to work in a, in a community with the principal, with the neighbors, to ensure that those kind of programs and that, that access is available is a key piece of how we can ensure that kids get the education and can reach their potential. And I think looking at it throughout the summer is an important piece of that. If you look at uh, the learning gap, and we talk about that, and, and I think directly related to the community schools and the kind of things that happen, it's, it's the summer in particular where kids don't have access to any kind of programming that the learning gap really starts to grow. So if you can take the community school concept, use it during the school year, make sure that parents and families feel comfortable being in the school, and then take that model and use it throughout the summer uh, as an access point for those kids to get that out of school time that really does allow them to continue to grow their learning throughout the summer. Uh, it can really be something that uh, students can uh, can learn and grow and that their potential is something that they can really tap into. And it really is when you talk about Tate's a Village, uh, the work that you did up here in the Highlands and creating that is something that I think should be a model. And, and, and again, I think the mayor's right. It's not reflective of one specific neighborhood, but in each neighborhood there's an ability to bring those neighborhoods together and find the right mix and the right model that works for those neighborhoods in the community. Yeah. Thank you. I just want to close with a, a, a little um, extra information. We have now got permission in with, I'm taking a group of students uh, from Salem State University, three graduate students, three undergraduate students, and we're going to Finland on spring break. And we're having Harvard come up with a, help us uh, do an evaluation system um, to evaluate uh, Finland's school, because if you're not aware of it, Finland is the number one country in the world for education. So we're going with some students, and we have an evaluation system, and we're going to um, do the research, meet with the Department of Education, and come back and present it um, to the National Coalition for Community Schools. That's how important this program. It's gone national and international. Thank you. Thank you. I, 
I am so excited, and this question, I'm gonna ask it. <laughs> and it goes to Senator McGee first. Okay. Only 12% of one in 10 city worker, including city hall, DPW, police, and fire department are people of color or minority. However, more than 60% of people in, of lean and 80% of people in highlands are minority or people of color. City doesn't, the city doesn't require contractors to hire a number of people of color like Boston does. In 2015, in fact, out of 622 city employees, only 71 were non-white. In 2017, out of 579 city workers, only 70 are minority. And it's possible also that um, 10 de department director of the city of Lynn will retire by next year. Do you have any goal to increase the number of qualified people of color or minority who work for the city? Thank you for the question. And I think uh, clearly uh, it, it, it's always been the city of Lynn's um, biggest asset has been our diversity. It's really been our strength. And uh, it's something that we need to, I think, build on and move forward on. And there is a great opportunity as the, uh, as the uh, Lynn item recently reported that there could be a lot of movement at the city level in terms of positions that will be made available. And it, it's important that everybody in the community understands that those um, opportunities are available. And that means working with uh, business leaders, uh, community groups, PTA uh, organizations in the city, and the, and the different diverse um, ethnic groups that live in the community so that people understand, one, that these positions are available, and two, that the opportunity is there for everyone in the community so that as those jobs are available, people are willing to apply for those jobs and be eligible to be a part of the city as we move forward. Um, I think it's important, and I will have a complete open door policy uh, in the city uh, as we, if elected on November 7th, so that th as these positions and other positions are are uh, available in the city, that we ensure that the city, uh, the city hall workforce reflects the diversity of the community, and uh, that's going to be one of the uh, one of the priorities that I bring to the table as uh, as the next as the next mayor if I'm elected on November seventh. Uh, when I became mayor, we did not have a person who spoke Spanish in City Hall. Uh, today, we have Spanish-speaking clerks in the assessor's office, the city clerk's office, city council office, and the parking department, just to name a few. Um, I believe one of the very first ways we can hear the voice of all of our residents and all of their diversity is to give them the platform to have that voice. So I've made it a priority to put people of color and people of Hispanic dissent on our boards and committees. And, and just some really prominent examples, Magnolia Contreras was one of my first appointments as a mayor to the EDIC board. Jimmy Gonzalez serves under me at the Parks Commission. Miguel Funes is the very first Latino to serve on the Liquor License Commission. I was also the first person to appoint a, a Latino department head in Mani Alcantara and the first um, District Chief of Color in the Lynn Fire Department, Steve Archer. Within my own office, I have employed a Latina clerk. I had a Haitian uh, gentleman as my assistant. I had a biracial chief of staff. Um, and not just diversity as to color, I've had a clerk with Friedrich's ataxia who uses a wheelchair. I've had an openly gay chief of staff. I believe that we have to give everybody the opportunity to be seen as a part of our community. And I've worked very hard to reflect that in my hiring practices and my appointments on boards and committees. I'm not really so sure about my opponent's record. Frankly, I tried to look it up. It is protected information at the state. So I believe the only way we'll be able to get this information is to ask him what his hiring record has been as far as hiring people of color and people of uh, Latino descent.
Grant, and I will uh, leave the rebuttal to him. I'm proud of the staff that I've had in, in, in my Senate office. Uh, it's a staff that I've had over, some of them have been with me since I got elected to the Senate. I have four women and I'm one, one man that works in my office. My chief of staff is a woman. So the diversity related to women is, is a clear priority. Uh, and I was chair, chairman of the Democratic Party for three years and uh, included hiring uh, both an African American, uh, a Latino as a small staff, uh, uh, four or five staffers that I had as uh, as I was chair of the party, but more importantly, I worked closely with uh, numerous uh, ethnic caucuses, the Latino caucuses, and made sure that as we uh, appointed different chairs within the committee, the state committee, that it was a diverse and welcoming group. I ran several conventions, and key leaders that spoke that were leaders of the Democratic Party uh, reflected the diversity of the Democratic Party and the diversity of the Commonwealth. So I think I have a clear record uh, as leader of the Dem Democratic Party, and I think as, as a senator in reflecting the, the, the staff that I have related to women. So I'm proud of the record I have, and I'm proud of my uh, ability to bring people together, change uh, the dynamic in a way that ensures that everyone is a part of that uh, process. And, and again, like I said, I'm proud of my record. This question is from Mr. Bauer. Mr. Bauer, come up. My name is Bauer Beswa. I'm, I'm a resident of Lean for 40, almost 42 years. So I know, I've, you know, I know what happened in the city of Lean for all these years. So I have a question about, um, you know, let me start again. Like Lean, Lean Woods, the High Rock Tower Park is a historic place. In fact, in 1979, the park was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. It is a resource and a potential viable attraction for visitors. It is stated in the Lean Open Space and Recreation Plan, quote, the High Rock was given to the citizens of Lean for their enjoyments forever. I don't know if all, some of you know about it. But over the recent years, the city has received various fund, funds. Example, the Community Development Block, Block Grants, funding from the Massachusetts uh, Historical Commission, the bond funds, etc., for works on a high rock tower park. As a mayor, what changes or improvement are you considering for the park and all the tower? In the same connection, how will you effectively communicate to the residents of a city that the park and the tower in particular you know, are for their enjoyment forever and also a learning opportunity or a learning resource? <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, well, um, we have had a number of improvements that got that were uh, made to High Rock before I got there, uh, but under my administration, we were able to put the stairs in leading from Essex Street. Uh, we've also put in improved lighting and cameras in there. I don't know if all of you know this, but there's an observatory with a telescope up at the very top of High Rock Tower. Uh, and it's open on Tuesday nights in the summer and into the fall. The arrangements can be made with community development to go ahead and uh, view the stars up on select Tuesday nights. What I'd like to see improved, and um, this ties into the education component of your question, sir, is the uh, carekeeper's cottage that's at the base of the High Rock Tower. We have been working to identify funds so that we can get it restored and reopened. And what we envision of the use of that, that carekeeper's cottage is to have a little educational center to tie it into the uh, telescope in the observatory up at the top of the tower. We could bring in groups, it's certainly large enough for a couple of classrooms worth of children, 50 or 60, 
Um, not only could we use it for teaching the children about astronomy and science and, and the universe around us, but we could also use it as a perfect place to reflect on Lynn's history and what the Hutchinson family did when they gave Lynn the High Rock Tower. Um, it, it's just a perfect jumping off point. It is not ready for occupation yet, but my community development staff is constantly working on um, places to apply for park grants. And we were able to fix up Lynn Common with almost $2 million worth of park grant funds. I think it was 1.6 million. And we're certainly looking to identify another round of park grant funding that will use um, that would be used to fix up the Stonekeeper's Cottage and make it a small education center. Thank you. I think, I think it's a great question and it's related to the history in the community and there's such rich history throughout our city and I think High Rock Tower reflects that as the mayor talked about both the tower and the, and the uh, Hutchinson's home, uh, the former home uh, that is down below the tower, uh, the lighting that's going on there now uh, and I think the, uh, the programming is starting to happen up there, particularly on the 3rd of July with uh, the, Frederick Douglass, the Frederick Douglass speech that's I think six, not, six years now has become a real uh, event that really ties not only the history of High Rock Tower, but really the history of the community together. And I think that is something that we need to continue to look at. And I think we, we need to tie it into many of the historic uh, pieces that are in the downtown that are very close to the High Rock Tower, whether it be the uh, Grand Army, the Republic Building, the, the history that's happening downtown, the arts, the vibrant arts that's starting to happen. So I think it is really a perfect opportunity to continue to build and, and grow on, on those uh, uh, things that are happening already in, in this area. And so I think it's important to try and get people up to this area in a way that enhances the programming that's now going on. Uh, and I think as the mayor talked about, the, the estate grants that have come in for the park, both for the common and the expanded common grant, and to look to state money to, again, uh, the dollars that are available to put some more dollars into the High Rock Tower, ensure that we get a chance to use that in a way that the community, more of the community gets up there, because it really is a rich and vibrant resource uh, whether it be able to uh, use the uh, telescope in the tower or taking advantage of the the house down below and, and, and linking that, I think, is a good a good idea that the mayor has in terms of linking that up to uh, uh, what's going on in the tower, the history of the community, and just as importantly, tying some STEM learning into uh, with what's happening up here at the Kip School and at the Ford School in the Highlands, uh, building those bridges. And, it, and it clearly with uh, the community, the community uh, neighborhood school that we talked about, and the history that's up here, there's, there's opportunities to continue build and grow on what uh, progress we've made uh, so far. David is still excited. He has one more question. So come up, David. This is a follow-up question on High Rock Park. And we'll focus on it because the parks are the center of the neighborhood. Hello. Oops. Oh, I shut it off. Okay, we're back with this. Parks are the center of the neighborhood. Um, the question is, Cook Street Playground, which is on the other side of Ford School, was recently the scene of fights, drug use, and gang activity. Our community garden, which we built five years ago, reduced that activity to nearly zero and helped bring families to enjoy the park. We want to build a garden at High Rock Park next to the Stone Cottage. 311 neighbors signed our petition approving a garden, including Council Colucci. 186 people want a plot. Last year, there were many drug overdoses at the cottage. I believe there were nine at the cottage, right in front of us when we went up there, uh, someone was shooting up. The food project agreed to pay for it. Build and manage at KIPP would send, like to send students there to do community service. Girls Inc. will send youth to help. However, the Parks Commission said the community development prefers flowers and fruit trees, which will not stop gang activity, as we know. Do you support a community garden at High Rock Park, or will you help make it happen? Thank you for the question, David. Uh, I think we've seen some great success, whether it be the, the Acre uh, Community Garden down off of, off of Essex Street, 
of the community garden that's going on uh, with the food project work at both of these locations, uh, down on Monroe Street. It really has changed the dynamic in those neighborhoods of uh, creating a different feeling, uh, addressing uh, the crime issues I think that you're talking about, David, and more importantly, letting students be involved in uh, what's going on, what farming is all about, and really seeing the real results. I had a chance to go down there recently when they were doing the, uh, the harvesting uh, at the end of the year and to see, uh, see the work that had gone on in the, uh, in the, uh, the, food, uh, the food projects uh, farm down in that area is really pretty amazing. So I think it's, I think it's a good idea to take a serious look at that, uh, see if it would be fit in within the parameters of what we're talking about. And I think as we talked about earlier, it's, it's enhancing the whole area in a way that uh, brings people there and, and develops uh, more uh, access points to that. So I, I think the, uh, the results that have happened both in both places in the city have been really um, successful. And I know that uh, there's talk of going up into West Lynn and, and creating more uh, public gardens up in that area. I think they've been really successful and it's an opportunity to take advantage of getting people there in a way that addresses those issues. And I, I think the other piece clearly is uh, 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 making sure that we have enough police on the street and that, that is, is uh, reflective of a challenge we face. Our budget is facing a challenge right now. But I do think that by working with the community and taking a look at a public garden, it really is, it, it, I think it's a sensible uh, direction for that area to go. Um, well, uh, first of all, I'm surprised to see that the Parks Commission and Community Development prefer fruit trees because if any of you have ever had a couple of fruit trees outside your house and you get all the squishy rotten fruit on your sidewalk, I can't see how that would be attractive for High Rock Park or any park. Um, I have been a strong supporter of the gardens in the community. In fact, when uh, the food project was having trouble renewing their lease due to the um, very vociferous objections of a neighbor down by the Ingalls School. I worked very closely with the food project in order to convince my colleagues on the school committee that renewing that lease was the right thing to do. And since that time, it has thrived, it has expanded, it provides thousands of pounds of food for the community every year. Similarly, when the Ford School wanted to introduce a garden into the into the Ford School lot. I fully supported that. I supported Harley's, Harley's greenhouse. Um, Harrison Harley had the vision of putting the greenhouses up at the Ford School. Um, and the CSA that goes down, um, goes on down in downtown, Monroe Street. This feeds the community. It educates the community. It even introduces the community to different kinds of ethnic food. I've never had yucca until I had yucca from one of the community gardens. I forget which one. But this is something that we can all learn, and if you'll pardon the pun, grow from. And I would like to see it continue. I'd like to see it continue at High Rock Park. I'm going to find out why on earth anybody would think fruit trees are a good idea in a public park. And I'll let you know. Senator McKee, do you want to rebuttal? I'm all set. Oh. Good discussion. Okay, thank you. <laughs> all right, so we're going to have a couple of questions from the audience. One question is from Ms. William Joseph. Ms. William Joseph, can you come up, please? Good evening. Uh, I, we are really in Lynn, we are we really lucky to have uh, to uh, have two candidates that been involved a long time in the city's life. We are very lucky, we don't have any newcomer here. So, um, and also we, uh, as uh, Highlanders, we, all our questions are mostly focused on the development of the Highland. I understand that because with most of us, we are islanders. I would like to ask you, um, because you've been in, in the city's life for a long time, what is one of the um, one of the uh, things, anything that you've done for Lynn that make you feel proud of that that you've been part of this accomplishment? 
and the second part will be what is one dream that you have, a big dream that you have for Lean and the future so we all of them, all of us can enjoy. Okay, uh, I think this one goes to me. Thank you, Mr. Joseph. Uh, I think one of the things of which I am most proud was um, my ability to get the Thurgood Marshall Middle School built and built in such a beautiful way. Um, prior to the Marshall School built, being built, the last school that the city had built was the Lynn Classical High School. And we all know um, that, that there were some shortcuts done and the pilings were not proper and we ended up having 22, 23 million dollars worth of repairs that had to be done just to stabilize that school. So I think this, you know, the city closed the Fort Annex after that time, they closed the Fallon School, they closed the Washington School, we were going in the wrong direction. So when I took office, one of the very first things I did was apply through the MSBA to get funding for a new Thurgood Marshall Middle School. The process took six years. It cost the city quite a bit of money. The result is we had a school that opened ahead of schedule, on budget, gives 990, almost 1,000 students, state-of-the-art learning environment. It has become a community area. It, it houses a community health center for the students that go there, the community health staff, the room down there. And it has been used as a model for the Commonwealth. When people from other communities are looking for a pre-designed pre middle school, one of the designs that the Mass School Building Authority gives to those communities is the design for the Thurgood Marshall Middle School. And this is not just my pride that should be evident here. This should be the pride of every Linner who supported that school. That school won its funding by an almost 90% to 10% vote. You all saw the vision, you believed in it with me, and the result is a state-of-the-art middle school. I didn't have time for my dream, I'll do it on the rebuttal. Thank you for the question. And um, you know, I think in, in some respects, being able to get the dollars to create the new uh, extension of the community college is one of the things that I think I feel uh, really proud about. It, it creates, it, it expands what has been a really true uh, resource for the people in this community. The original building that was built, uh, it was already uh, full when the doors opened. It's the place where a community college needs to be and to work to get the dollars and more importantly to work to then ensure that those dollars were authorized and spent and to see that new building uh, opened and uh, creating the opportunity for people in, in the city of Lynn, young people in the city of Lynn. And, uh, you know, it really is a, a diverse age group that goes and uses that community college. It really is a key piece of the community and it really has built a real partnership between the community college, there's a community uh, program that's going on that is really partnering with uh, the, the schools within the city. It really is becoming a place that people can find the opportunity for the education you need for, uh, for a future, for your future and for your family's future. And it is uh, continuing to build relationships with the Salem State University. And, and something that I think relates to education that I really feel very proud about as well was the ability to get over 20 years ago working with Representative Fennell uh, the dollars to create the ET Machinist Program, which has uh, over the last 20 years given over 500 uh, people in this community that were looking for a second chance, the ability to get in, get the training they needed to get good jobs, good paying jobs with benefits. Uh, and like I said, there's been over 500 people that have been able to parlay that program into creating a new life for themselves. So in some respects, that's on a personal level. I've been at the graduations every year to see those students who've gone through and watched the change it's made in their lives. So education, the opportunity to create the community college, and then to create a program that, I, that has really uh, created opportunity and changed people's lives are two things that I, that I think I'm really proud of. And uh, uh, in terms of a vision, uh, I'd really like to see, I think we need to think big. There's opportunities here, whether it be the downtown, the neighborhoods, and our waterfront, and I think thinking big gives us an opportunity to, to take Lynn to another level. Um, just, I'll just take a quick part of my rebuttal, which isn't really a rebuttal, but I didn't get to answer about the dream. I really believe the city of Lynn needs a hotel. 90,000 people in this community, not one hotel room, 
1,200, 1,500 students graduating from North Shore Community College every year. Their families have to stay out of town. We have murals. We have shows at the auditorium. We have a beach. We have a golf course. We have Lynn Woods. And anybody who wants to come and visit us has to stay outside of the city. So what I'd really like to see in my next term as mayor would be to have a, de a development of a hotel preferably down on the Linway. I think that's the most logical access point for something like that. A lot of excitement, but we run out of time. So I'm going to give the candidates two minutes to wrap up, starting with you, Senator Murphy. Thank you. I, I want to thank uh, everyone that's here tonight. And I want to thank the people that asked the questions. The questions were asked, and I know it was uh, through a process that the questions were submitted and new questions came tonight. But we're less than two weeks away from the election, uh, and it's been an interesting and exciting election over the last, I think, five or six months as we move forward. It's important that you get involved, make sure you vote, talk to your friends and family vote. It's about the direction and the future of the community in the city of Lynn. We've had, over the last two um, Mayor's races, we've had a 30% turnout in the city of Lynn for, for these elections. Uh, that's really a, a poor showing when you talk about how do we, as a community, reflect on the changes in the direction of our city. So it's important that we get out and vote, regardless of what candidate you decide to vote for, it's important that you get out and vote, make sure your voices are heard. We're talking about the Highlands here, so when, I know there's a lot of issues in the Highlands that are really important to people in the Highlands. It's important for the people in the Highlands to have a 50, a 60 percent turnout because your voices will be heard as you become part of the process. It's not just coming to meetings, it's not just uh, voicing your, your uh, vision of a better future, it's about being involved in the process. So I urge you to talk to your friends and to your family, and as this is on, on uh, cable uh, TV as well, this is an important election. Get out and have your voices heard. And I really believe that the city of Lynn, we, we really, this is a city that we all believe in, that I know that if we come together, we can really move this city forward in a way that's going to change the city for us, for today, and for tomorrow, for our children, and for their children. So I ask that you stay involved. Uh, I ask that on November 7th that you give me a vote. I really believe that I bring the vision and experience uh, to make this city, move this sort of city forward in a direction that I know will be uh, better for everyone in the community. So thank you again for being here, and make sure you get out and be a part of this process over the next couple of weeks. Thank you very much for listening. actions speak louder than words. The senator has had 23 years to increase diversity on his staff, and all I heard about tonight was the women that he has hired. I didn't hear any names or any positions of anybody of color or anybody of Latino descent uh, who has held any sort of position, in particular a uh, policy-making decision on his staff. If you care about opportunity for all, I would ask for more specifics. I gave you the specifics on my answer, and I would expect if you are looking for some direct information before voting on November 7th, each of you in the audience would do the same. I'm not going to read the rest of my list of accomplishments. I have an eight-page list that can be emailed to you, or it can be picked up, or it can be sent by snail mail to you. It's available by calling 599 Judy, simply leave the contact information where you would like us to send that, and we will be more than happy to get that to you. If you have any questions regarding the eight pages of accomplishments that I list on that, on that um, handout, please let us know. Call the office. I'll be happy to give you a return call. I want to thank all of you for coming tonight, and I appreciate your attention. I appreciate the moderators doing a fine job of keeping us on track. Uh, and uh, I, I, again, ask for your vote on November 7th. Thank you. I would like to thank Keep Academy for giving us this space and providing us with the equipment that we can we can use tonight. I also wanted to thank both candidates, Senator McGee and Mayor Kennedy, 
for this time and for coming up here, responding to our invitation. I want to thank them. I also want to thank other candidates that are in the in the in the audience. I saw few. I saw Rick Stabar and I saw Jenny Figueroa. Please thank you for coming. Thank you, Natasha, for being here. Thank you, all of you. I also wanted to thank Celine Cam TV for recording this and giving us with the record. I wanted to thank also all our student volunteers that work really tirelessly to make this happen. A lot of phone calls, a lot of sending out flyers, phone call, and all this hard work that they did. I wanted to thank them. I wanted to thank also our own and only Yoneki and Miss Shamara that work also tirelessly to make this place ready for tonight. I want to thank them for all the hard work. I also want to thank Papa Gas, <laughs> Mr. Gas, David Gas, for coming up with the idea of this event tonight. I want to thank him. I wanted to thank our IT director, Mr. Tanzir Malik, for the image and the question on the and the board, I wanted to thank him for all that he did. I also want to thank you, our neighbor, and our community for coming up tonight and for your time this evening. And I also want to thank Highland Coalition for this event. Thank you so much. If you haven't signed up yet, please sign up at the, uh, at the table at the end there. And uh, please put all your... Um, Please put your your um, info and question in the box, and then we'll make sure that the candidate will have it. Thank you so much. We went a little bit over time, but it was fun. Thank you so much.